Okay, we'll start, I guess. Um, we have a full no room now. Um, good afternoon, my name is Eja Kamar. I'm a researcher at the Adaptive Systems and Interaction Group at Microsoft Research. And today, I'm very proud to have three amazing speakers um, talking about human AI collaboration. And Barbara Gross yesterday gave a great keynote kicking us up on this topic and what kind of capabilities do we need from systems that are going to be collaborating with humans and how it is different than systems that are just going to accomplish some tasks on their own. And this topic is becoming even more critical for us at Microsoft where our, one of our missions now is augmenting human intelligence through AI. Um, so we are going to start by having three short talks from Eric Horvitz, from Milan Tambe, and from Rao Kamprabati. Um, on, on their research, but then we are going to have at least half an hour at the end of the session discussing what they've talked about and other things maybe that didn't come up during the talks. So please think about what questions you have for the speakers. If you have something particular for them, we are going to accept a few questions after their talks. But please think about what are the harder questions you would like to ask to all three speakers um, for the, keep them for the end of the session. Um, so we are going to start with Eric Horvitz. Eric doesn't have an introduction. He's been introduced a few times already. Just at one. least twice, <laughs> okay. and two more introductions are going to come this afternoon. Um, but Eric Horvitz is, um, is a technical fellow at Microsoft, and also he's managing labs, MSRAI. That's it. That's it. And our group, yeah. our group That's too, right. Adaptive right. Systems and Interaction. So, Eric. But by the way, the uh, next two sessions, I'm introducing other people. So I think I'm, I'm sharing them. So. I thought I'd just be very brief today, but just uh, amplify a couple of things I said yesterday um, uh, and point out some great opportunity areas for building deeper human AI collaboration, models of people and tasks, models of complementarity, and coordination of initiative. Um, there's a whole community called user modeling, and even that community, I think, has just barely scratched the surface about what it means to build with our representations and our inference machinery, uh, systems that could continue to operate uh, uh, side by side with people as they work on tasks and both interpret the, the state of a task uh, as well as human goals and needs. If you can do that well, you can imagine you can do all sorts of things. And over the years, we could go through a long list of our attempts to build user models, probabilistic user models that could take um, uh, desktop activity, uh, data structures changing state uh, in various kinds of software, including Microsoft Office software, like Excel, for example. And that would compute probability distributions over things like uh, goals, sets of goals users might have over time and sequences of goals, uh, tasks, um, competencies, um, uh, particular needs for decision support, for example. And I decided to keep the, all the, some of the examples out of the, the deck right now. I want to just mention these high-level principles and then show some videos and have you think through what the videos mean. Um, but the basic idea is you can, you can imagine you can, uh, some, some of the work that I, I found the, mo the most interesting dimension of this kind of, of, of effort in modeling was uh, building systems that can model the world with lots of sensors, and then model human beliefs about the world, and then use both of those distributions to, to drive um, uh, decision support. I mentioned yesterday's idea of complementarity. Um, I, I like this picture where I think about all of cognitive psychology over the years, uh, identifying um, what makes us human in terms of our cognition and our, our abilities and limitations across memory, attention, and judgment among other areas, ability to attain concepts, visualization. There's great literature out there. Um, uh, but thinking through uh, what's been done to date with complementarity, we, again, barely scratched the surface. Um, AJ Kumar and I did some fun work a few years ago with Galaxy Zoo, where we actually considered the competencies of a vision system and detailed competencies of different people coming into a citizen science system to uh, create joins. But here's an example of what's, what we see becoming more popular now. So last year, there was something called the Chameleon Grand Challenge, uh, asking, uh, based on a big data set of pathology slides um, of lymph nodes, uh, can you build a, a, a system that could detect metastatic breast cancer in lymph node sections? 
Um, that was the grand challenge. And of course, you had, you had normals and, and uh, metastatic cancer. And um, the, human, the, the best uh, uh, automated system was, a, was, a, was a, a convolutional neural network. But the human was superior. But then in the paper, the last few paragraphs of this paper, after they celebrate their the results and talk about the human being superior, they say, well, wait a minute. If we actually have a very simplistic algorithm that combines the output of the neural net and the output of the human beings as they look through their slides, they can dramatically reduce the error. I mean, that's a, a dramatic reduction in error for, for a lot of patients. Again, that's a very simplistic approach. We're not thinking about the details of what happened and you know, what's been going on. You can imagine going further if you actually dug into the black box of the two intellects and the combination of their skills. Here's another example. I think it's interesting. I was talking to Murray Campbell last year at a conference. Murray Campbell was on the Deep Blue team. And he said, well, here's where we are today with chess. If you look at um, blitz, five second per move blitz chess, 30 second per move rapid chess, classical three minute uh, per move, and then correspondence chess, which I wasn't very familiar with. It's like a, apparently three days or more by you know, email or, post, or US post <laughs> snail mail. Uh, but, but the idea is that human beings are, are in the blue here. You see that computers back in 1997 began to dominate. But look at the green here with human plus computer and what happens with correspondence chess where people have time to think through and play with computers. Um, now, I asked Murray, I said, has anybody ever built a computer system to play chess that was built to augment human chess playing versus just being a chess playing machine? The answer was no, not that he knew of. And my thought was, wow, if you can do that, if you built a machine that could search, you know, so, for example, show a human being visual search spaces and help a, a human do A-B compares, not just play many games, wouldn't, couldn't you do much better with that kind of a, of a centaur-like system? Just a question that I have looking forward. So on complementarity, um, there's, back to the literature again, uh, there's really fabulous uh, cognitive psychology I want to really promote again and again here. For example, work by Sperling, who uh, I consider a colleague now uh, down in Irvine and, and Milchner, when they were both at AT&T Bell Labs, uh, did work on something called the Attention Operating Characteristic Curve, where they would give uh, human beings uh, two, a, a dual task challenge, like two visual, ta visual search tasks, and push them hard and give them an objective function, and find out what human beings could do when it came to divided attention, for example, and how this kind of knowledge could help us think through, for example, divided attention scenarios where we demand users to deal with an alert and back to their Word document and so on. This is a little kind of, just a piece of the tip of the iceberg of that work. Now talking about the complementarity is one piece, right? But then there's how do you deliver, how do you inject the intellect into problem solving with a human being? And this is coordination of initiative. How do you coordinate? So the way, just to use my blob, I like to think in blobs, I guess, or maybe that's my artistry. <laughs> but here, here's a problem at the, at, the, at the user's focus of attention here. Imagine a really smart computer someday that says, hey, I can actually, I see that blob, and I can decompose it into subproblems alpha and beta, and I can't touch alpha. That's very human. I know that. I can help you with beta, though. And th there's a whole communication strategy. I'm going to do, I'm gonna do beta, alpha, let's recurse. And can we build systems that understand how to help decompose and provide this, a, a, a volley of initiative in solving problems? Subscribing to principles of complementarity and so on. Now, it, it turns out that the, there's been some really nice work, um, some of it pretty formal, by, by, by psychologists who are psychologists of conversation, like Herb Clark. And uh, they talk about this idea of, and they talk about conversation, but I, let's just map this to problem solving, because it's the same kind of thing here. And they talk about, in a conversation, and we have several people from the, from the SIG dial community here who know this stuff very well, there's the idea of contributing to the conversation with conceptually in a back and forth volley. This is Herb Clark and Duncan and Goffman and Goodwin. But here's one, a picture that's often drawn, I think uh, due to Clark originally, where there's multiple layers that need to be sort of you, to work on to ground with another human, human, human they talk about, but let's talk about this with human machine, where a channel is established, like we're gonna, we're, we're gonna communicate now, I'm talking to you, engagement. There's a signal, so there's a signal detected. Let's say I'm talking to you now, the words are going, are, are, going, are being processed. Um, there's an intention, that's the meaning behind the words. 
And then there's the actual back and forth of volley or what's expected, who goes next, and who's going to contribute, who's going to listen now, uh, this, this multi-level um, uh, process. And I like to look at the top piece here. I'll rename it flow of initiative for any kind of AI human collaborative um, system. So um, I, I, I think Greg Hager's here. Where's Greg? Greg. So I'm on the advisory board. I'm very proud of Johns Hopkins uh, CS department. And so I, I can sort of lay some pride in, in, in talking about some of the work that you've done, Greg, with, with your team here. But let's go to healthcare for a very concrete example of a, of a physical, we'll lay out, lay out a physical uh, example, but the metaphor is a metaphor for anything, any kind of collaboration. But I love this work by Carol Riley and others. I guess she was a master's student she did this, correct? Yeah. So, so what, what Carol and team did is they looked at the taking some imagery of surgery and they, they were reasoning about a grammar of surgery. One of the first steps you need to sort of accomplish in, in getting in, in getting in coordinating initiative would be to recognize state. And so the idea of the, being able to, uh, an HMM model uh, they use to recognize a reaching needle situation. So it's a human being doing this action and a, a machine is recognizing the state of, in a surgical process, insertion, left transfer, loosening. And if you knew these states, and I'm not sure, and Greg maybe can comment later about this, how much that this has been used in actual uh, larger scale coordination, but if you could actually um, uh, recognize state and you had a, a robotic surgeon that was going to work with you, and this was Children's Hospital like it's a year and a half ago in a science translational medicine paper, work with you on a, a repair, a surgical repair here, humans working with a machine, this is an anastomosis repair which is a very complex, complex repair in surgery, it's, a, it's two tubes being sewn together like an intestine cut, cut in the middle and reassembled. Um, but it's interesting to see there's a, there's a robotic system that's looking at the kind of the, the seams here and so on, and then there's a back and forth, a kind of a volley between the human and the machine. And again, I'm not sure how much coordination the machine was doing here, but you can imagine where this is going someday. So I wanted to show you just a couple, a few videos now, I'm going to probably go a little faster. A few videos, and just, this is work with, and Dan Bohus, is, is Dan here somewhere? Yeah, that's Dan. Work with, uh, that Dan led up. Um, I think I need to click on these. Um, but we, we built a trivia system that would, for a variety of you can read about this work, but we were looking at coordination between people and machines where uh, IBM did the, the Jeopardy system, we did like the, the, uh, the Trebek moderator system, right? So, so we're gonna give you the first, the, the view out to the two individuals, the human subjects who gave us permission to release this, uh, and their view from the machine in a second here. Next question, Lydia is the only country- The red dot is the, is the gaze of an avatar. What color is it? Yes. That's right. So far you have one correct answer. Now on to the next question. So that's the view from the machine out. Now you get a better idea what's going on here. So far you have one correct answer. Now on to the next question. In the US, a hospitals have a red cross. What sign do they use in the Arab world? Solid blue circle. Is that correct? No. So what's the correct answer? Red crescent moon. Yes. That's right. So so just now, she she, we're being very anthropomorphic here, turned to the young man and said, raise, just raise her eyebrow. <laughs> and it was very fluid. He, he, he agreed, yes. Uh, he knew what was going on, and you can imagine signaling, even subtle sig microstructure of signaling can be very important in, in, in collaboration. Here's an example that highlights the, the importance of, of models of attention um, in our AI systems some data coordinating with people. Dan and Eric are the actors here. Do you need help finding something? Yes. Could you tell me the room number or person you're looking for? I think it's uh, 4800. If you get to 4,800... No, no, I think it's 4,300. Sure? Yeah. Excuse me. 4,300. Go, go along that hallway. I'm looking for 4,300. So just a little bit of an annotation here. I think it's uh, 4,800. To get to 4,800. So here is the attention of Dan. 
And we're saying here right now, the system actually is, is, is waiting, but it waits long, it times out and then says, excuse me. Excuse me. And now it's gonna, it's gonna wait again, but it's gonna actually try to get, it's gonna use a very interesting technique from Goodwin. It's gonna stutter and try to get attention back. Go along, the, go along that hallway. I'm looking that was very explicit in terms of the design of the system. And if you think that's just acting here, here is in the wild, again, with permission. Take the elevator down to the second floor. Turn left as you walk out of the elevator and continue on to the end of that hallway. Excuse me. Isn't that cool? It's, it's, it's pausing for the glance. Huh? Excuse me. Can I, can I help you find something? Can you tell me? Morning. Do you need directions? Excuse me. Do you need directions? How to get to two, two, two. Okay, so here's another kind of signaling that's going on, and again, I'm going to ask you which you like better as human beings. This is a multi-level uh, a, a, a graph of uncertainty over time, entropy over time, in several levels of a conversational conversation for the uncertainty a system has in uh, visual, the, the visual signal, what's being said, the who goes next in a conversation. And here's the other version of it now. We, take, we use the same kind of signals to drive facial expressions to commit to, to, tra to transmit uncertainty. This is the assistant by my door. We call her Monica. We have a male version called Chad. So it's very equal, equal representation here. Watch your facial expressions. Hi there. Are you here looking for Zach? Yes. Are you here for the two o'clock meeting with Zach? Sorry, did you say you were here for the two o'clock meeting with Zach? Yes. Is one of you John? Yes. Sorry, I can't tell who is speaking when you stand so close together. Which one of you said there, John? I did. Right. Hi, John. Zach is expecting you. Will you be joining the meeting? So, sorry, will you be joining the meeting? Yes. All right. I've let Zach know you will be joining his meeting with John. I'm sorry. I think Zach is running a little bit late. I'm pretty sure he's on his way. So I think what's interesting is um, to think that I, I love the fact that we did this with Tomislav, um, who is uh, an intern uh, working with us maybe is it three summers ago now. It's kind of scary, Dan. But what's magical is that it's, it's entropy signals spread over variables of you know, uncertainty about what's going on directly controlling musculature. And I love the fact that we had this running, you're looking right down the heart of the probability distributions, and it looks very natural. And it really is doing what people do when they communicate about various levels of uncertainty. I thought I'd end briefly by going back to my first year at Microsoft. Um, we did a user study. Um, it was the Microsoft Intelligent Assistant Study, and we set it up very briefly. It, we have Andrew Kwatnitz, who was a, became a GPM at Office, and finally retired like maybe eight or nine years ago. He is playing the role in this case. We did a whole week of these studies in a secret soundproof booth, not secret, soundproof, soundproof booth. And he can't, he can't hear a, a subject who's gonna be given an Excel task. And she's like a medium level Excel user. She's given a task on a page of paper. We asked both of them to, to basically do protocol analysis, to talk out loud about what they were thinking. And we asked Andrew, do your best to magically, through an interface you can type in, help this person complete their task. I want everyone, as I play this, just a few minutes of it, I'll just play. Think through um, initiative, complementarity, and coordination of what you would do, what kind of agent you would build to help out this woman. And again, it, this, after this week, we did a, a full, full report on what we learned, which I think was very interesting in terms of the findings. Um, so let me move forward here. Here we go. All right, I'm going to move over days and nights away. Ooh, okay. 
and this person is very good at keyboard shortcuts. Or, or they're very proficient with selection, so you don't really need help there. Um, not sure what they did with that. They're trying to center, center that. I wish I could see their whole sheet <laughs> all at once. Okay, row height. So I'm going to give them a direct, that they can just drag the row and column headers. You can just drag the row and column headers. And that says goes over the bottom table. Okay, so width. I'll find a place to put it. I'll go down to okay. the bottom table and make sure there's space here. Really Don't know if they need that. Okay, now they might have once said specific <coughs> okay, one, but because they them were just drag the row of column numbers, letters to change the height or width. Look like they were just guessing. You can just drag the row or column okay, letters now to they're go up to the column header. Um, um, <coughs> I'm not sure that that applies to this task. That's I wonder if they're trying what this means. Okay. Um, okay, I don't know how to do that. Let's see. I'm going to say if you're trying to do. Combine if you're trying to combine multiple sheets into one file, one file create, create a new workbook using file new, file new workbook. Oh, now now file they're doing it. <laughs> they must want to do that. All right. Now say now you now add. You Anyway, it was really interesting to watch hours of these videos and watch when people did sync. It was amazing because then they started like, they're doing it. And they, they were sort of signaling back and forth. You can tell there was a sync. But before the sync would happen, there'd be all this guessing. And no, it, this is distracting. It's like a paper clip of some kind, which actually came out of this work. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> OK. So I'll stop there. But I wanted to just leave you with this, these, these examples. Thank you. So we have time for one or two questions if you have anything specific to ask to Eric. Yeah, David. So um, you're talking, several I've seen earlier today, sort of look at sort of more human-like behaviors and sort of simu simulating human uh, behaviors in order to get the user's attention, get them to behave certain ways. And it's got me wondering whether um, that's that's going to also come with perhaps costs. Like suddenly people are going to invest time in being polite to uh, an entity, which it's not helping that entity when you're being polite to them, and it may be slowing you down or making you frustrated or or, or something. Um, By the way, I, I disagree with your first comment. There was, there was no notion of us trying to get people. To, it was trying to be fluid and be more natural-like in this particular situation. Right, I, I understand. Project. But that, that fluidity was sort of through trying to get the system to to, get, to act like a human, so that people would would respond to it uh, in in sort of humanistic ways. And I'm wondering if there are f more fluid ways. If you're going to treat, if you tr want to treat it as a tool instead of simulating a human being, does that does that increase the fluidity or decrease it? It's a, it's a good question, David. I think that um, I could have picked examples of Cortana circles floating through the walls. We have these <coughs> ambient projects now that have this really fun Cortana circle that on the walls, and it has different kinds of uh, symbols that coming out of it. And the whole idea of whether it should be anthropomorphic, I think it's a separate issue. I was trying to more focus on, um, and maybe with these examples, you, you, you got thinking about the the naturalistic part, but it's more the, the coordination, the signaling. Um, you can imagine LED lights instead of eyebrows flashing, and maybe that would be less distracting to people. Maybe someday you have to pick your interface, and some people will want this anthropomorphic-like experience. Some people want the flashing LED, which is the attention light. And we've had one of our projects was called Deep Listener before Deep Learning was even a big thing. It was, it was, like, it was an interaction with Deep Blue, and it had just like a HAL, a HAL lens. You know, the HAL red lens of the HAL 2000, and it would turn, as you were talking to it, it would go from green, which meant with a shine on it, you know, glass, to like it would go yellow, slow down, and turn, and turn red, and it would get confused, it would turn different colors. So it's like you watch this thing, and people got very, it was a very natural experience to have this like expression, to map expressions and uncertainty to the color of the lens. But it's a good question. Okay, let's, thank you, Eric. Let's have our second speaker. <laughs> 
Our next speaker is Milan Tambe from University of Southern California. In addition to being um, a professor in the engineering department, he is also a founding co-director of USC Center for AI in Society. Um, Milan is a AAAI fellow and ACM fellow, and I've been admiring Milan's work since my early days of uh, my PhD because in addition to doing a lot of theoretical contributions to the field, he also has been very successful in putting his work into the real world by um, helping the Coast Guard to become more secure, you know, delivering his ideas into LAX Airport and also uh, for environmental protection. Hello. Thank you uh, for coming uh, to my presentation. So I'm going to be talking about the essential role of uh, human-machine partnerships in domains of uh, AI for social good. This is work uh, that was conducted at our USC Center for AI in Society. And this is a, a center that's a collaboration between our School of Engineering and our School of Social Work. I'm a co-director from the AI side and Eric Rice from Social Work is a co-director from the Social Work side. Our mission is to advance AI research driven by the 13 grand challenges of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. I'm not uh, listing all of them, there's only a few that I've listed here, but they include big things like ending homelessness and achieving equal opportunity and justice and so forth. Uh, the, UN, uh, the international version of this is the UN Sustainable Development Agenda. Now, of course, these are big, big uh, grand challenges. What can we practically do? And so I'm going to highlight three major areas of work at our center. I'll start uh, with the work that we've been doing for uh, a building AI assistance for low resource communities. And here, I'll emphasize the word AI assistance because we are building assistance decision aids. And so this is a concrete project here is work with the homeless shelters in LA one big challenge is spreading information about HIV amongst homeless youth. Harnessing their social network, we can show that AI algorithms are far more effective in spreading such information. But not only is there a more spread of information about HIV, but we get to this end state where uh, uh, these happy uh, young people that are shown here, and I'll come to this, this is an important point of uh, this research. But there's other projects in this area intervening uh, for substance abuse prevention, uh, suicide prevention, and so forth. So that's one big area of our work. Another is uh, AI assistance for conservation. And so one concrete problem here is in work that we've been doing with the Wildlife Conservation Society and Uganda Wildlife Authority, and this is in Uganda. They're trying to predict where poachers place snares in order to trap animals. If we can predict accurately and get rangers to patrol and remove those snares, we can potentially save lives of animals. Uh, we've done a uh, long experiment recently, for example, uh, multiple months, where we've been able to successfully predict uh, such snares, uh, remove these snares, get poachers arrested, and potentially thus save lives of animals. There's other projects, for example, drone patrols in South Africa, where we can detect where poachers and uh, animals are, so we can send rangers to try to interdict them. In the past, we've run projects with the U.S. Coast Guard to patrol in the Gulf of Mexico against illegal fishing and interdict in uh, illegal uh, logging in Madagascar with an NGO there. Uh, a third area of our work is AI assistance for public safety and security. This has been a long-standing area of our work. Big challenge is that we have a large number of targets, not enough security resources. How do you schedule or plan or allocate limited resources? We are appealing to game theory and solving a large-scale game uh, we can then create patrolling schedules. This is, for example, our algorithms that work uh, uh, around the Staten Island Ferry. These Coast Guard boats that patrol, they've completely changed the way how the Coast Guard used to patrol this. This is a sol after solving a spatial-temporal game, you get a patrol schedule, and the Coast Guard have been running this. And this is the same algorithms that have been used by the Federal Air Marshal Service to assign air marshals to flights by different uh, law enforcement agencies uh, in the LA area and so on. We're happy to see several of our collaborators now picking up this work, uh, whether in Israel to monitor traffic, in Singapore to patrol the ports, uh, in Buenos Aires Airport, it was funny when we were, uh, well, funny or not, but we were in the Ichika in Buenos Aires and the uh, airport was patrolled 
uh, using software based on our ideas by the uh, University in Buenos Aires. So uh, these are three major areas of work that we have ongoing. My point uh, here today is to emphasize uh, that in doing this work, there's really a human-machine partnership that we have to emphasize. For example, you'll see in the work the social workers do their task and the AI system does, does its task. But the partnership is not only between individual users and software, it's also uh, with the organizations. And so this work requires us in low resource communities to partner with the homeless shelters, with the same place for youth or my friend's place in the LA area. Uh, for wildlife conservation, it's organizations like WWF, uh, WCS. And then uh, public safety and security, it's uh, agencies like uh, TSA and the US Coast Guard and other law enforcement agencies. In this talk, I'll primarily focus on our work on low resource communities. And I'll start with a sh uh, small video clip uh, from our work to highlight the role of uh, my PhD student, Amulya Yada, who did majority of the work, and Eric Rice, uh, my collaborator on this work. At the USC Center for Artificial Intelligence in Society, we are researching ways to leverage the power of social networks to address complex social problems. My colleagues and I have focused on one particular problem, how to use artificial intelligence techniques to prevent the spread of HIV amongst homeless youth. In Los Angeles County, homelessness has reached a crisis level with nearly 47,000 people experiencing homelessness on any given night. Homelessness is and has to be our top priority. After all, real lives are on the line. Sometimes overlooked in this conversation is the increasing number of homeless youth. There are up to 6,000 homeless young people sleeping on the streets in Los Angeles. These homeless youth are 10 times more likely to be exposed to HIV due to high-risk activities such as unprotected sex and needle sharing. Among housed youth, less than one half of 1% have HIV. Yet among homeless youth, nearly 10% are infected. Educating all these youth about HIV is a necessity, but this goal is unachievable due to limited resources. So I'm uh, going to get to what we do about this, but as you can see, since we are close to Hollywood, this was our attempt to be Hollywood. And so when I took this video, full video, and uh, showed it to my family, their response was, please don't do this again. This is not for you. Uh, but, <laughs> but we did submit the whole video to AAAI. Uh, <clears throat> AAA reviewers fortunately only focused on the technical aspects and not on our acting, and so this uh, worked out well for us. So uh, the challenge here is that we are given a social network. This is not a Facebook network, but this is actually face-to-face -face network of these homeless youth observed by social workers. This is full of uncertainty, and we have a capacity limit, so we can only bring in, let's say, five youth at a time. Uh, we so we brought them in, we've selected them carefully, and now there's an education session where our social work colleagues educate them about sexual health and condoms and how to communicate this information with their peers. This is a peer-led intervention because these are homeless youth, they're untrusting of adults, and therefore this has to be done by peers. So, our, uh, so this, is, this is how this uh, session unfolds. So it's a whole long day session. They now are free to go out and spread this information among their peers. But in return, they also give us information about the network. I'm friends with so-and-so. So-and-so is connected to so-and-so. So we get more information about the graph. And that means that we can now be more clever about the next five youth that we will select for intervention. And then, again, the same process unfolds. We get more information. And then we bring in the next five youth. And so the process is a, a dynamic process where we gather more information. It's not a one-shot, a single-shot decision problem. And so it's influence, influence maximization in a dynamic, uncertain fashion. And this problem can be solved as a POMDP. And essentially, the homeless shelter is running this adaptive policy. Uh, it chooses youth. Uh, when we act, they get, get us more information. And that means that this policy can then select the next five youth. The AI problem here is, of course, solving uh, this massive POMDP. I wouldn't have time to really uh, go into how we generated this algorithm, but that's the technical contribution. Now let's look at what happens. First, let's look at it in simulation. These are two graphs, uh, homeless youth graphs. On the y-axis is the amount of indirect influence, the non-peer leaders who would be reached by our algorithm. And the two dark green lines, these green lines, this is our algorithm, so call it healer, and the others are baseline. The gray in particular is degree centrality, bringing in the most popular youth for intervention. You can see that in simulation, 
uh, the, you know, the bigger the green lines are much higher. So this is showing that there's promise in our algorithms to do better. Well, what would happen in practice? And so we did a pilot test uh, bringing in 170 homeless youth, 60 roughly in each condition, two under the AI conditions, and one in degree centrality, bringing in the most popular youth. And so this is the traditional method of how they uh, spread this information about HIV. And so the way this would work is we get a preliminary network from social workers. Uh, we run a healer. It will say bring in these five youth, in this case these four youth. Uh, they give us more information about the edges in the network. Then we bring in the healer runs again, brings in the next four youth. And in this way, we got 12 youth to spread information about HIV in this network. So we did this, and the question now is, who got to, who got to more youth uh, in the process? So we are now looking at non-peer leaders, the people we did not bring in for intervention. The AI algorithms, uh, Healer and Healer++, has shown reach about 70% of the non-peer leaders. The traditional method, degree centrality, uh, the popularity approach, it reaches up just about 25%. So clearly, the AI algorithms are able to reach a, a larger fraction of the non-peer leaders. But does this getting this information actually lead to changing of behaviors? And here it's showing, if you look at the portion of the dark green bar that, got start, that started testing for HIV, again, again with the AI algorithms, a larger fraction of youth started testing for HIV. And with the earlier approach, here we got no conversions uh, starting to test for HIV. So why does this happen? And this is an important point. Uh, these AI algorithms are looking for people in far corners of the network. The popular approach, the heat degree centrality approach, it sort of hangs, uh, brings in people who are well connected to each other. So if you look at the percentage of edges between peer leaders themselves, these are useless edges. They don't really transmit useful information because they're among peer leaders who we are already bringing in for intervention. So this uh, degree centrality here is like 20%. Uh, with Healer and Healer++, they're going to far corners, and uh, therefore they don't have edges amongst these peer leaders, and that's, saving, uh, and that's very important because that uh, information transmission is not wasted. There's another way to look at it. If we, there are different communities in the network with these AI algorithms, we are getting coverage across different communities, and with this most popular approach, we are not. Why is this important? I'll come to that in a minute. But let me first show you uh, a testament from our uh, partner, Alison Hurst, a safe place for youth. Beautiful way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with this social service world, like and how we can, we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. If this group became a, a really big thing, it could really help out a lot of, of youth. And so the next step here, having uh, done this pilot test, is to do this test with 900 youth, and this has already begun. Uh, 300 enrolled under different uh, conditions, healer and healer plus plus, three in no condition, null condition, and three with uh, 300 with uh, the most popular approach. Now let's come back to this picture of uh, the smiling youth. So one of the things that was very interesting that we noticed is uh, people who were selected by these AI algorithms, there's actually a different kind of an impact on them. Uh, in fact, some of these people actually change, their, turn their lives around, they felt empowered, uh, they have stable jobs, these youth in particular have houses and so forth. And so my uh, colleague, uh, my collaborator, Eric Rice point, points out that picking youth as peer leaders was changing their self-esteem and the sense of confidence. So we often talk about AI algorithms bringing in biases that are negative. Here's a, a, a bias that's been brought in by this AI algorithm that's positive. These were youth that were not traditionally uh, seen by the housing agency. These were not uh, people who were spotted by the homeless shelters. They were in the far corners, but they were playing an important role. And these AI algorithms picked them up and, and in this way actually helped them change their lives. So I think this is, uh, we have to be careful when we talk about biases because the biases can go both ways. Uh, there's a lot of other work that's uh, going on in the center. I'm not gonna be able to cover everything. Uh, for example, substance abuse prevention, again using social network, uh, trying to help with suicide prevention, matching homeless youth to homes in LA, uh, this is a project that uh, started this summer, trying to think about North Korean refugees settling down in South Korea, modeling TB spread in India, and modeling gang violence in Los Angeles. 
I wanted to very briefly in one or two minutes also talk about a completely different problem and a completely different kind of AI assistant. And here I wanted to talk about uh, wildlife poaching in Uganda with our colleagues in Wildlife Conservation Society and Uganda Wildlife Authority. I'll just highlight main results. So this is a beautiful place. This is Murchison Falls National Park. Uh, wonderful animals, there's, there's threats to wildlife, snares, thousands of them that get placed to attack these animals. So our task is to predict, given a grid over the park in each grid square, well, how likely is it that the poachers would attack? We're given these uh, features and we're trying to predict uh, where snares would be placed so that rangers could remove them and uh, save these animals. So this is first just showing you in simulation. This is training data over the past several years and looking at what would happen in how well would we predict attacks in 2015. And the dark green bar is our best model. You can see that it's significantly more accurate compared to others and standard machine learning models that we threw at this problem. But uh, this, is, uh, uh, this was a uh, simulation. We also did tests in the wild. And so this is, uh, we would tell them, okay, go to find these snares. And here, for example, uh, this ranger has found the snare. You can see that this is not a very easy task. Uh, them going out to find these snares, but helping them locate this is important. And so we chose two nine square kilometer areas in uh, our pilot test where we predicted hotspots which they were not patrolled. And so we said, here's where you go and you, find, you will find snares. Um, and they hadn't patrolled these areas frequently before. And we were pretty good in predicting what was going on, going on in these. A poached elephant was found. We were too late to save this elephant. But um, next, they found a whole snare, uh, snare roll of el uh, elephants. So what this means is uh, poachers were active in this area. They were poaching uh, elephants. But before the next elephants could be killed, we were able to remove these snares and hopefully save lives of elephants. Uh, we also found 10 antelope snares here. A next test was uh, a six-month test where we created these 27 different areas of nine kilometers square each. Some were predicted to be high, some were predicted to be low. And the goal here was to get the rangers to walk these and find snares. The rangers didn't know which one was which, uh, meaning which were predicted to be high attack areas and which were to be low. And we found our catch per unit effort, this is the way we measure this, number of snares found per kilometer. In the high area was 0.11, in the low area 0.01, tenfold difference. So we were pretty accurate in predicting where snares would be found. The traditional, the historical catch per unit effort is 0.04, so certainly we seem to have helped these uh, rangers. Uh, there's uh, other uh, side effects. So when the rangers went out in this area, they would find, uh, in one case, they found a trail. They, chased the tra they pursued the trail, found a camp of poachers, ambushed the camp, arrested poachers, uh, confiscated wire snares, and so forth. And there are many interesting findings uh, along the way. But let's, uh, let me now wrap up and talk about what we have learned in general. Um, in, in this area, it's really important to build uh, these partnerships between uh, humans and machines. Humans focus on their expertise in AI assistance on theirs. Humans, uh, social workers will talk to homeless youth about use of condoms and so forth. And the AI algorithms are figuring out which nodes to select in a social network to transmit this information. In building these assistants, there's got to be a right task division for human versus machine. The AI algorithm is saying, okay, within this one square kilometer area, you're going to find snares. But whether it will be hidden under this bush or this tree, well, that's, the, that's what the ranger would know, and that's what they, uh, they focus on. So we leave uh, each uh, with the particular expertise that they have. But there's also this notion of adjustable autonomy. And we have to be uh, right about this in the sense that uh, if we say human is always right, that's not going to work. As I showed, there are wrong biases that human uh, bring to the table. And so sometimes you really want uh, the machines, the AI, to override what the human is really trying to do. And finally, interpretability, transparency, this is really important. Um, you know, even the homeless shelter wants to know why did you select these youth and not others? Finally, um, these are, I mean, one of the questions that uh, AJ asked was, you know, how, how would we make these implementations really work? 
And one of the important points is uh, the partnership is not bet between only the AI and the user, the particular user, but it's also a partnership between us as researchers and the organization um, uh, that we're trying to implement this in. Immersion within the organization has helped open our eyes to the challenges that really face and the trust that gets built up. The other thing we notice, of course, is having a champion on the inside of these organization has really helped us in getting, these, uh, getting the software out there. So I'll end by saying uh, there's tremendous potential for AI for social good. And if you wanted to come to our website, that's uh, case.usc.edu. Thank you. We can get a few questions if you have anything you want to say urgently. David? <laughs> if, if nobody else is going to ask questions, I'm happy to. Um, so you, you, it was beautiful work to show how you could sort of have this impact on, on the students, on, on the homeless uh, youth that you brought in uh, beyond the effect that it had on other people. Um, but is that, th bringing them in meant that you didn't bring in some other ones, <laughs> right? So I mean, so there's some ethical questions there and also, uh, I mean, these sort of battling utilities for, for, for different participants. How did you sort of weigh that? No, I think this has really uh, been a surprise to us. I mean, the whole point originally was, um, first of all, thank you for your comments. Um, the original idea was this is purely a way of spreading information about HIV. And it was just a surprise that the people that were brought in with the traditional methods did not have this kind of an impact. But the ones that were being brought in uh, by the PUMDP planner seemed to have changed uh, you know, ha behave differently. They have become uh, more responsible. My uh, collaborator tells us a very interesting story of how this uh, youth that we had selected, uh, the homeless shelter, was like, this, this person, you're using this person as a peer leader? Uh, but then when, uh, when he was actually called, he was all, you know, uh, sober and, and really ready to go, uh, activated, and not only did he do his job, but also that seemed to have turned his life around in terms of him finding a stable job. So there's something else going on here that we don't uh, uh, completely understand. But it's an interesting thing to say where, uh, you know, that this is, uh, this is a situation where there is some nice bias, uh, something that the humans were overlooking that the AI algorithm had picked up on. But you're right, there are more complicated issues here that need to be understood. But we are at, uh, you know, we are at the beginning stages. It's at least good to see this effect so far. I'll ask a quick follow-up question. Do these teenagers know that they're being selected by an AI algorithm? Yes, that's the most interesting part. So there have been cases where we'll go and say, okay, there's two of them. Say, the, you know, you've been selected as a peer leader. And the other person will say, what about me? I say, well, the AI. algorithm did not select you. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So it's a, it's a algorithm. So it's, it's not a human being who did that. Um, so it, it can go both ways. It can go both ways. Do we have a question here? So did you find any interesting, like a unique patterns among these homeless people, like? A, they do have their own communities or not? That's right. So the, uh, actually, they are, these graphs have a very particular structure. The youth that hang out together on the beach, the ones that uh, play basketball. So there are smaller communities that are tightly connected with sparse connections to others. And the, the PUMDP algorithm, the only way to scale it up was really to exploit the fact that there are these communities and uh, that's how we were able to scale it up. And so there, there is certainly structure in this graph, and uh, there's a whole lot more that can be done to scale these up, uh, harnessing those to scale up these algorithms. Let's get the last question, and then Ralph can shut up in the meantime. Okay. Do you think it would be possible to take the same approach, but in this case try to combat the spread of negative information or fake news. So if you were looking at the dissemination networks and understand where the best intervention would be to try to provide additional evidence to combat misinformation. Certainly, I guess the way this whole work got started uh, was a visit uh, to USC by uh, 
a major who was serving in Afghanistan, and his problem was that he had to take his 30 uh, members of his unit and spread information about, uh, you know, the U.S. Army and say that, you know, to get the villagers to not uh, support the Taliban. And that was where, uh, you know, this whole work started. Uh, and then it turned out along the way that I met Eric, and he said, well, this work can be used for this. Now, we never uh, got the data from Afghanistan, but we did get data from, for the homeless youth. So there is a significant potential, certainly, for this kind of work. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rao Kampramani. Um, he, Rao is a professor at the Arizona State University, and he is the current president of Triple AI. Um, and he is also involved in the partnership of AI. Okay, thank you for showing up. Um, so AI is very big these days. You know, every day we are just bombarded with news about AI. Um, so, for example, you know, you have like. CNN is reporting all sorts of important news about like AI helping humans. Um, so you don't believe me, right? I mean, clearly it's fake news. The reason you know it's fake news is not just because AI can't be without drama, but also because we really never have news items about AI helping people. You know, if you look at the way we run our lives, it's more like this, right? So essentially, we take humongous pride when AI systems beat, you know, humans in every possible thing, right? So, for example, <laughs> for example, we have, you know, we beat uh, Kasparov. I mean, that's a lot of news coverage. We beat Libratus. The Libratus beat the the poker guys. That's a lot of news coverage. AlphaGo, poor KG, and Lisa all. That's also a great news coverage. Um, it's it's almost as if, you know. AI has this curious ambivalence to human beings, right? So our systems seem happiest either far away from humans, right? Even way before even the most recent AI, um, you know, hype. You know, we had uh, Spirit and Rover just basically taking over Mars, right? Are of course in adversarial stance uh, with humans. So as the you know uh, John Lennon uh, said. We want to help humanity, it's just the people that we somehow can't seem to stand, right? Um, now this, you know, even when we try to force robots to kind of work with humans, all sorts of interesting things are happening. Like, for example, if we force them to cohabit, they either seem to run over us or try to commit harakiri. So this is the kind of situation that we are in, and this has been giving lots and lots of stomach, I mean, heartburn to you know, important people like, obviously, you know, Elon Musk, who is, again, out there talking about how AI is taking over the world and we really need to be worried. I, I mean, honestly, we need to stop freaking out Alan, okay? Because otherwise, none of you are going to get your pre-ordered Teslas, right? So we really need to slow him down a bit. Um, so it's important that we work on AI systems that work with humans, if for nothing else, to keep Elon be happy, right? Um, so, you know, back in uh, last year when I was running an uh, international joint conference on AI, uh, so one of the things we did was to have as the special theme for the conference, um, human aware artificial intelligence systems and with the with the tagline that uh, why intentionally design a dystopian future and spend time being all paranoid about it right so that was sort of the tagline and you know it looks like and in fact there was a very interesting set of activities around, around this theme including a very nice um, um, panel that you know Eric and Barbara and other people were involved and uh, you know after that panel actually in fact there was some sort of a uh, you know at least some people seem to have gotten it in the news uh, cycle that uh, human aware AI could save us from the robo collapse apparently this should you know be an important thing to look at um, so and, and of course, there are other places where uh, the human aware AI has sort of gotten back into, and you know, human um, in the loop systems have gotten back uh, into sort of research agendas. The JSON briefing that happened last year uh, essentially brought up the uh, importance the, for DOD to support human AI interaction. Uh, there was the, the uh, preparing for the future with AI uh, report that uh, Obama administration did that has a very long discussion of important um, uh, issues in human aware um, AI challenges. Okay, so now the interesting thing is why all this, why do we need affirmative action for human 
aware AI systems? Why is it that somehow that's not obvious? And I think it's actually worthwhile thinking about this um, from the point of view of AI, because it's been the case that we somehow feel that putting um, humans along with AI systems is sort of cheating. We, in the back of our minds, we feel that's somehow cheating. And you know, it doesn't help that the very first human in the loop system, the mechanical Turk, way in the loop system, human actually was cheating, right? Basically, he was answering all the questions. And you know, for the longest time, in the beginnings of AI, when there was a human in the loop, it was as a crutch to a really badly designed AI system. You know, in fact, in planning my area, we had uh, mixed initiative planning. What it involved is humans actually going into the bowels of the search queues of the planners and trying to kind of shift the search nodes around so that the planner can somehow live to see another day. Okay, so this is the sort of thing that we've been, you know, coming from. And so, like human in the loop or human aware AI is not like the most obvious thing that we would be thinking about. Um, but so I think that in fact it's important for us to take a new look at this, of course, I mean, you know, that we now have AI systems that are in fact, you know, powerful enough that humans are no longer a crutch. And in fact, taking humans into loop um, expands the enterprise of AI quite significantly. That's one of the things that I want you to, I want to consider, you know, uh, uh, push for that. Um, and then that it reduces some, of course, the, some of the off the top worries about AI. And, and most importantly, for the masochists, which are researchers, you know, we really want hard problems to solve. And I can tell you there are a large number of hard problems that you haven't even thought about uh, when you're just thinking about autonomous systems. In fact, I show this to my students that there's a statement that this is saying that this enormously large brains that we have, what we evolved with them not to run away from the tigers of the savanna, but to deal with each other. We are constantly modeling each other's mental states, and this is why we need it, essentially the kinds of brains we have. And so it seems to make more sense that the general purpose AI should really actually be thinking about handling humans um, you know, as partners, because that would be a lot more interesting set of problems to solve. Okay, so even the intro to AI level architecture of an intelligent agent, I'm sure you, you, many of you have seen this or taught about this. So there's this whole intelligent agent architecture. The moment you throw in, and, and in fact, to the extent, you know, if you just focus on pure autonomy, when they're humans, the humans are somewhere in the environment, as if they're like inanimate parts of the environment. But if we start looking at humans as essentially with mental states and intentions and beliefs and desires, which is what you need to actually you know, interact with them, all of a sudden, the agent architecture becomes way more interesting, way more complicated. You know, essentially, everything that you do, you no longer are just worried about what happens to the inanimate part of the world, but it's also what happens to the people's mental states. You know, how do I do actions that will actually push the mental states in the right direction and so on? So again, this point is that there is this much bigger scope of AI once you start looking at uh, humans in the loop. Uh, so that's sort of the thing that actually, so that the first part was to basically show that, you know, it's like, it's a bigger challenge to look at humans in the loop. It's not some sort of a watering down of the AI dream. And then, of course, in my own group, more you know, in the last like you know seven or eight years, uh, we've been actually looking. We somehow discovered humans, and we have started working with them. Um, and um, and so, of course, these are my humans and my robots. Um, and I'm sure uh, you can figure out. Um, um, this is a new Turing test. Um, anyway, so the kinds of problems that we look at uh, in, in, in my own group essentially uh, include human in the loop uh, planning system. So for example, you have um, you know, mission planning being done by human you know, mission planners, but with the automated system looking over their shoulder and trying to suggest either changes or to you know, exp provide expansions. And to do this right, essentially the system needs to keep track of the intentions of the human planner and, and also you know, keep track of the mental state. And that becomes important. Again, this is quite different from the old type of uh, mixed initiative planning systems where essentially it was the human which was helping the planner rather than the vice versa. So I like to say that in the past, we, the humans used to go into the land of planners, but the whole point of AI is to get AI machines to come into our land, not us to go into their lands, right? 
Um, and then, of course, a more fun sort of uh, uh, experiment, uh, uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, applications that we look at are human-machine collaboration in the context of human-robot collaboration. Um, so in this particular case, for example, uh, we have <coughs> Intention recognition, human intention recognition being done. Uh, in this case, slightly more directly, uh, the people are wearing emotive um, you know, uh, helmets, which just do very simplistic level of P300 uh, brain signals. And even that are enough in some cases to get a sense of what the human was looking at and you know, what in this particular case, you know, which uh, block does this guy want versus uh, which block does he want the robot to actually pick? So these are the kinds of things that we can look at. And then uh, there's one more, since I'm actually in um, Microsoft, uh, this is a HoloLens, which basically can be used, in, in this particular case, the HoloLens is being used by the robot to actually project its intentions into the sort of the visual field of the human. So, so not only are humans looking at the common workspace, but they're also getting some additional information about what parts of the workspace that the robot wants to get to. Um, you know, so this sort of intention recognition and projection is something that's like a very important part of collaboration. We do that you know, in day to day. Typically, we tend to do it in a multi-model way, so sometimes it'll be by language, sometimes by gestures. In this particular case, I just showed you, you know, two specific augmented reality style ways uh, of doing that. But um, now, you know, we also look at, for example, the, the bigger sense of these sorts of uh, uh, you know, human-robot collaboration in, in larger scheme of things, like, for example, search and rescue scenarios. Um, so we actually came up with, like, uh, recently one time, uh, a variety of um, scenarios in the search and rescue uh, domain which look at different ways in which humans and you know, robot collaboration can be um, facilitated and with, with increasing amounts of technical difficulty. Uh, so that, that sort of thing also we look at. And uh, one last plug in this case is to say that there's like we, we have a, a paper on the, on, on the, on the uh, archive uh, talking about some of the challenges in terms of this sort of uh, um, you know, agency, human aware AI agents, you know, what are the kind of questions that you look at. Now talking about challenges, uh, in my remaining few minutes, I want to actually mention some of the challenges from the point of view of planning and then, you know, and then you know, sort of take any questions. So one of the biggest things, you know, I, as I said, I'm mostly interested in explainable, uh, mostly interested in uh, agents working, you know, robotic agents are virtual agents working with humans. And so it's not just a one shot thing, it's a more of a behavior being shown and the question is, how if, if a, a robot is essentially trying to come up with plans of action, um, normally it has its own model of the world with respect to which it can come up with an optimal plan. The difference when it is actually working in the presence of a human is the human has their own expectation of the model, the capabilities of the robot, which is, is uh, you know, MH, and the robot is no longer just trying to do what is optimal with respect to its model, but also what is expected by the human because of their approximation of its capabilities. So, and in fact, that leads to two very interesting aspects. If you wind up doing what you are expected to do, then the humans are not spooked and they find your behavior explicable, so it's comprehensible to them. So to explicability involves essentially a robot trying to make a plan, a behavior that's not just optimal with respect to MR, but also close with respect to what would be expected from MH. Um, and then sometimes explicability is impossible because it's just too costly to do what the human is expecting you to do, at which point they might ask for explanations. And when there's an explanation required, explanation is not just talking to yourself, uh, but really trying to make sense of why your behavior makes sense if only the human can get a better understanding of your capabilities. So the explanation dialogue is all about getting the human to come to the same page as you in terms of your model. Okay, so we actually look at it that way. Uh, so explanation, as, beyond explanation as soliloquy, which is essentially model uh, com uh, comparisons. So. With respect to that, the kinds of challenges we, we have uh, include interpreting uh, you know, what humans are doing based on incomplete human preference and domain models. And now this is the incompleteness is something that came up yesterday significantly, uh, that in open worlds we have, of course, models are incomplete. You know, you want to think of openness, open world, talk to humans. 
Okay, most of the time, they don't know exactly what they want, so which is actually partially specified preferences, and they have an approximation model of what you are actually capable of. That's, again, incomplete. And so in some sense, much of your behavior now has to be taking into account these highly partially, in, you know, partial models, okay? Uh, plan with this kind of incomplete domain models, uh, show explicable behavior and provide explanations as needed, and when you're providing explanations, it's not just soliloquy, not talking to yourself about your model and why you're right with respect to your model, but to explain to the humans how they should change their model of your capabilities so that next time around an explanation is not needed. Okay, and then finally, uh, we also look at understanding interactions between humans and machines. You have to evaluate this. So a bunch of you know, engineers sort of deciding what humans would like and then providing you know, sort of uh, a design could be a bit of an oxymoron. And there's a, a well-developed area, human factors engineering. And so in fact, it makes sense to work with them to set up careful experimentation. So in my group, I actually work with uh, uh, Nancy Cook, one of my colleagues who is a human factors uh, society president. And actually, so we, they wind up doing human-human um, uh, experiments, which we then bring forward uh, to learn lessons from them and then actually design the planners, which we can then do additional human-machine experiments. Uh, which all of which, by the way, require IRBs, institutional review board certifications. AI people typically don't even know what IRB stands for. I was one of them, you know, seven years back, and it turns out that it's very hard to say that people should take us seriously about how we are interested in helping humans when we don't know what IRB is, because that's what you will wind up needing if you actually work with humans. Okay, so that's that, and uh, I'm just going to quickly make a couple of points about the, the challenges. One of the challenges I wanted to mention about is this, how to learn and plan with incomplete domain models. In the context of uh, planning, um, in the context of planning, essentially, we typically come with, start with very full, partial, you know, causal models. That's the way the, typically the world has been in planning. But it turns out that since the models that you're going to use, especially of the humans' uh, approximation of your capabilities, they are essentially uh, not known to you. You have to learn it from indirectly from traces. Uh, so we have been looking at multiple a spectrum of models that can be learned more easily, including very shallow models. So in particular, we looked at uh, uh, the idea, for example, just using very shallow models like action vectors, where you think of the planned behavior, the behaviors that you have seen as if they are sentences in the vocabulary of actions, and then just apply word vector methods. So that all you will learn is when you see this action, after a while, magically this action, this other action might occur. Now notice that you know, machine learning people have been trying to go from correlational models towards causal models. So planning, in my case, I'm going from causal models, which are hand-given, to correlational models because they're easier to learn. So it may well be that some of us will meet somewhere in the middle. But the point is that even these shallow models can be useful in actually providing uh, proper collaboration with the humans. And in fact, one of the other things that we showed in some work technically is that given the same number of plant traces, sometimes learn Learning the shallow model and using it might have a better performance than learning a full model because the full model winds up overfitting to the data because it has too many more parameters. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, in terms of explicability, uh, one of the interesting issues, as I mentioned, is that you want your behavior that you're showing to be closer to the behavior that the human would expect if they solve the same planning problem with respect to their model. And so it involves not only just minimizing the cost of the plan with respect to your model, but also minimizing the distance between that plan and the plan that the robot expects, the human expects you to do. Except the problem, of course, is the human's model of your capabilities is an unknown, and you have to learn this uh, uh, from indirectly. And so we wind up actually learning it from the plan traces. And for that, we actually set up, in some cases, a way of getting um, you know, using Turkus, a way of getting um, traces of uh, you know, robot behaviors that humans find preferable. So you can use that to, for example, learn these sorts of preferences. Um, of course, uh, and, and in terms of the explanations itself, as I said, we want to actually get 
the human's model to come towards your model. And there's an Ichikai paper that will be presented in Melbourne that talks about this as a search in the space of models so that essentially the explanation now is the deltas between the human's model and what it should have so that the decisions that the robot has made will actually become clearer. So this is sort of beyond explanations as soliloquy where you don't just talk to yourself saying, look, it makes sense because my model says it's correct. It's, Explanations are all about the beholder's model rather than about your own model, okay? Um, and then there is a, a lot of interest in general, a bigger issue here in terms of trust in autonomy in, in this human-machine collaboration. Trust is a much bigger complex issue. Um, there is a lot of mechanisms about the long-term trust, but at least the ability for, of an agent to show explicable behavior and provide comprehensible explanations is clearly critical for engendering trust. So you can lose trust very easily by sort of showing incomprehensible behavior, but you can gain trust hopefully by, you know, on a longer term by, you know, you know incremental progress. Um, so and I mentioned already that I work with um, human factors people in setting up actual um, in experiments in, in the human, the, for the human human studies, we actually use um, a Minecraft before the project, and the Malmo right now uses that. So some years before that, we actually were using um, this Minecraft as environment to set human human collaboration experiments that um, um, Nancy Cook and her colleagues would evaluate uh, for a variety of uh, team fluency issues, which we'll then take in decide, designing the planners, and then we can then redo those experiments with respect to human-machine scenarios, where one of these agents is controlled by the human, one is controlled by the planner. So I'm going to end um, that basically there are a bunch of uh, technical issues in terms of, in, at least in the context of planned behavior, uh, how does planning as a problem change because there is a human in the loop with a different model of your own capabilities. And in a bigger summary of the talk, as in the part one, that I would like to convince you that path to general AI goes through human-machine collaboration, really. It's a, and as, as a, uh, Barbara was saying yesterday, really it's a much bigger goal than can your robot hang around in, on Mars. It's much harder to hang around in the midst of us than on Mars. And then part two, I try to uh, tell you some of the planning challenges uh, in uh, human-machine collaboration uh, that we've been looking at. And I'm going to stop there and take any questions. Thank you. So please ask if you have any questions for Rao, and in the meantime, I'm going to get Eric and Milland to the stage as well so that we can have our um, general discussion. Any questions for Rao? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, forgot to introduce myself last time. Beth Minot from Georgia Tech, but I have just have adored this session, so thanks to all of the speakers. Um, I love your explanation that you give to your students, which is, you know, the, the power that we have here has evolved about making sense of other human beings and how we really should uh, pivot around our orientation around AI challenges. Perhaps a naive question, but are people working on systems that observe how other human beings are observing a person as additional inputs? So, for example, a security robot could be observing someone in, let's say, an airport, but taking into account how 20 other people are also reacting to that individual would be additional human wetware into making sense of that situation. I, I think that's a perfectly valid set of data to gather. So in fact, in general in this area, data sets are reasonably sparse. In fact, one of the questions that uh, HA asked us to think about is what data sets can we gather and put out there? And if this is the kind of data that would be very nice to gather, not just what the person, one person is doing, but what the bystanders are doing. And it would be very useful to capture that sort of a data, and hopefully we will. But right now, I don't know of anyone who is capturing that sort of data. I think my home AI agent would just decide to ignore me by watching the faces of my children. And if my children That's are possible. ignoring me, <laughs> it would be like, yeah, just fine, ignore. Yeah. Thanks. I think of a comment, Beth, is that in the, in the situated interaction project that I was talking about, one of the, I, I consider the, 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 probably the key breakthrough <laughs> in that project was multi-party understanding many people coming up to the system and their relationships and making that a foundational um, a target of representation and reasoning. Who's talking to who, 
when was the talking going on between two people versus the computer and so on. And so the, certainly looking at multiple people and, and what they were doing was part of the, the reasoning process. And obviously in a medical situation. Absolutely. You can imagine people like uh, you know, Greg's teams uh, you know, coordinating what happens in an operating room. Yep. Uh, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Who's getting, exactly. who's talking to who? Yeah. So while that is the ultimate goal, I just want to challenge you to think a little differently. So I had a PhD student who just finished, Elaine Short, who actually did exactly that. She did multi-party interactions with a robot observing and moderating. The robot never knew exactly um, what the people were talking about. In fact, we didn't even use any natural language understanding. We okay. could, but we didn't. It just looked at every other back channel timing information and was able to do things like moderate the conversation and get people to be more polite and in fact more kind to each other and less competitive. <laughs> so yeah. I just say that because I think there's this upfront assumption that you have to do you know, kind of AI and reasoning to achieve some of these goals. And it's really a combination of you know, a lot of back channel as well as you know, what are they saying, who is talking. There's a lot more going on than the that. The back channels are part, definitely part of the rich evidence. We don't necessarily have to do NLP to know who's talking to who and uh, even looking at face pose and, and so on. So I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's your traditional Bayesian fusion of many signals. So I guess I would just say it's rather than necessarily starting top down, you could start the other way. You can start bottom up and say, if I don't even try to understand what they're saying, but I go by these yeah. other metrics, you might go far. It ends up sometimes coming up with a very different solution. So, so I think with respect to your point, um, I guess we already, one of the nice things about the, this faculty summit has been, I think by my count, there are three panels on, you know, human AI, uh, things including in, in addition to the great uh, keynote speech. And the one, for example, on the emotions and the social uh, skills uh, panel, for example, was focusing much more on what can you do just by you know, looking at specific uh, emotional cues. And in some sense, that is important, but it's, there are also cases where you actually, if you're doing collaborative problem solving, it's, there's an entire behavior. It's not just trying to you know, react to a single emotional cue. So the way I... Yeah. And it's just important to get a lot of people talking. Exactly. You might be surprised that there isn't a necessary path. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, uh, this is a wonderful session. And uh, I think I have a qu I Recently, I read a report. It says that robots and AI actually make social inequality worse. That's so what do you think? Uh, I would like to hear about your views, and if it's, your, it's yes, then what should we do? And if it's not, why not? Thank you. So you're talking about robots making social inequality worse, like brown robots versus white robots, or something of that kind? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, basically, I think it mentions about, because in order for you to acquire knowledge of robots and AI, you really need more education. Oh, so well, in this way, yeah. I, I, according to the report, no, uh, that's why I would like to hear from, your, uh, from you and see how would you say it. I can send you the, this uh, URL, so, and <laughs> it's not my report. Okay. So let me, uh, let me uh, take it in uh, another direction. So uh, I spoke with the first uh, team that was implementing, uh, you know, installing first IBM robot, uh, first IBM uh, computer in India. So this was many years ago. And what their thing was, okay, you know, there's a factory where this had to be installed and there were workers outside and their whole thing was we're gonna lose our jobs, we wouldn't let this in, there's gonna be all kinds of problems. And so they wouldn't let this team in. So during a festival when these uh, workers were out celebrating, the engineers went in, they uh, put the computer in. <laughs> now, maybe some people lost their jobs right there and then, but on the whole, uh, this has really helped. Uh, the economy has got, uh, you know, a boom, led to a booming middle class and so on and so forth. So uh, I'm not, uh, I mean, uh, you know, this is a very, very complicated matter. There's so many uh, different directions to take this in. I don't think there's a very, uh, you know, like a clear-cut answer here. But, uh, I mean, 
I know in the past when you have uh, asked us questions, I guess uh, in the spring when Eric and I were on this uh, panel and uh, you were wow. sort of uh, uh, talking about this in terms of progress. I mean, the, it's very gray, right? It's, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's not really clear which, uh, where this is going to go, but I, I don't think we can necessarily say it's definitely going to get worse. So I think another point that actually one of the questions that AJ brought up for us is, are there tasks where essentially humans and robots have to work together? Are we really, humans can just completely be removed and robots can do everything? And that sort of plays into this because to some extent, you know, parts of the work that robots are doing might presumably be kind of making somebody else unemployed. But I, the way I see it is essentially the collaboration, collaborative human uh, AI interaction is the more interesting one because it's less about loss of jobs and more about effectiveness of what we do. You know, the humans are still in the driving seat, but they're getting this support from you know, AI uh, technology. It seems to me that while um, unemployment is, I guess, going to happen, there's no question, you know, it seems the AI you know, human interaction keeps us a lot more in the loop for longer time. And, and for good reasons, because there are many important problems where, for example, I'm not really sure I want to ready to, I'm not yet ready, I'm not sure of any of you, but I'm not yet ready for a robotic caregiver when I become old. You know, I still want like soft and fuzzy humans touching me kind of a thing. So I think it's like there are things where, you know, the collaborative aspects will basically keep us more in loop longer. And so that's like a negative, positive thing. So I'll make a quick comment. You wanted to say the URL. There are thousands of URLs on all sides of this question, yeah. so I'm not sure if I need to read yours urgently right now. <laughs> but let me just make a com comment is that there's lots of uncertainty about, about the economic influences of various kinds of advances in, in machine intelligence technologies. Um, one thing is certain, though. It's pretty clear that these advances will lead to trillions of dollars of, of, of resources injected into our economy, and the question is going to be how is that distributed and how does the, the, the AI mechanisms influence that there's a recent National Academy of Science report that uh, was published after two years of intensive study. And the, the key result of that, well, the key guidance was we need more data, we need more monitoring, we need more tracking, we're flying in the dark. So I'm not gonna sure I need to read your URL very quickly, but we, uh, you can send it to me, I'm happy to look at it. Thanks, so I, I'm not sure what you meant, but I wanna pick up on what Eric just said and say, I think, it's not just about jobs. Yeah. Okay, uh, 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 Rao mentioned IRBs, which by the way, you only have to get if you're, <laughs> if you get, it, no, not, if you work with people and you're at a company and you don't take federal funds, you don't have to get an IRB. We so have, we, we have an, an IRB. Here. But we do but it's important. I know, I know Microsoft <laughs> is a good citizen in this regard, but certain other companies are. But, and, and here I think Millen's work actually speaks to this. It's also about the data you collect and the communities you work with. Right and that we should be careful not to be like the psychologists who use sophomores <laughs> at their universities as their subjects. And we should be careful not only in whom we work with, but also when we give talks and put up uh, slides of the people we're studying, they shouldn't all look like um, Eric. <laughs> 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 they should look more like this panel. <laughs> <laughs> is the problem. <laughs> I knew but, we'll take, but, we'll take a, but we'll take a few Eric's. So, so I do, I have a question, so and that was all commentary, that we shouldn't just Get think it's all about jobs. Obviously, I like collaboration. Um, working with people is really, really challenging, and, um, and there are issues of privacy with respect to data. Um, on the other hand, sharing data is really useful. So just related to that whole complex of things, I wonder if you have comments on how we can become a stronger community in um, sharing the data that we have, and also what we learn about how to do those experiments well. Well, one, one comment I'll make is that, um, as, we, as many of us know in the AI community, great leaps and surprises have come of, 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 of challenge problems being defined, and these days more and more with, with, with challenge data sets. Um, when we did Microsoft Coco, MS Coco, um, it, this was common objects in context that led to, to, to uh, uh, work at several sites and in academic centers on image captioning, photo captioning. It wouldn't have happened without that. Uh, as lab director at the time, I was asked for a quarter of a million dollars and then, then uh, by, by Larry Zitnick at the time, 
and then he doubled it. He wanted a half million dollars. And both times I took it out of my secret slush fund. And I said, this, this is really important. Let's go for it. And look what happened. We had like, like within a year, we had like a New York Times article with four uh, senators competing with you know, similar, similar capabilities, different approaches to it. Then we had, then we said, well, that's an easy problem. Let's do this. Let's do, you know, uh, uh, general FAQ questions. And it, it went, we, these data sets are really critical for, for, for exploration, and they've always have been. I think we need to really invest there. And I, I think, I know we will. Um, uh, the partnership, I'll make one more comment. The partnership on AI uh, has a, a, one of the goals of the partnership and that Rao and I are part of is to close the data divide between the large companies, not we can do it completely, but to, to address the gap between large companies that have proprietary data sets and uh, other centers that might not have access to those data sets. And I think that we're trying to work through solutions on that right now, and there's some interesting approaches. So I guess uh, I'll make two comments. First, with respect to sharing of data for on the research side, unless there's a reward, uh, there's some reward system that we get something out of this, uh, somebody who mm -hmm. makes such a data set public uh, can publish it, get some public, you know, some credit for a publication or something. It's just not uh, not something somebody will do. Uh, it, you know, so we I understand that in other fields like in conservation biology, this is an accepted practice. Not only do you get credit for the data, uh, but also even for the R code or whatever that you share. And unless that uh, becomes a standard practice, I don't see how I would advise my students to say, you know, spend your time trying to make this available and so forth. And that's something that uh, we need to grapple with and kind of understand how that would happen. But the other uh, part, and it's a really wonderful question here, Barbara, is uh, some of these data, I mean, we, are, we have to go out in the field. I mean, some of this is very unclean in some sense. We don't quite understand as, we, as AI is going out into society, uh, this is, you know, you're working in, let's say, homeless shelter or in some uh, park in Africa. The data is sort of very unclean. It's hard to know what, what we are getting. There's all kinds of restrictions and all sorts. And so there's a whole, uh, I mean, th th there needs to be some kind of an understanding of how we mature as a field to share such data and what does that really mean. It seems in conservation biology uh, that th there's a lot more of it. Uh, there's a lot more of understanding of what all this means. And uh, I mean, uh, I don't see that in our field yet. So, so one thing in, in respect to, you know, even though you made it probably partly in jest, this issue of uh, having, you know, the uh, cultural mores taken into account when you're setting up these kinds of experiments um, is very important because I think there's a fascinating amount of work on the, the acceptance of technology across different cultures. So, you know, I, in fact, even in the small experiments with explicability and explanation that we have done, there are some people who have the more of a Mr. Robot knows the right thing kind of an attitude. And so for every, everything the robot does is explicable for them. You know, essentially they're not particularly questioning. And there are other people who are a lot more picky. And so in general, essentially, it, there is, I guess, not. it should not be surprising that there is no such thing as a single human, <laughs> you know, and, and so while we tend to, you know, even getting these kinds of data, it's going to be an issue of, is it just personalized to one person or is it personalized to particular groups? And that's something that we need to take into account. We have to conclude the session very soon, but Beth, if you have like a quick comment, we'll take No, it. I just want to agree with Eric that it's really important to frame the conversation around disparities in AI from multiple perspectives, and jobs is clearly just one dimension. If you look at healthcare alone, whether it's improving remote diagnosis for rural, me rural medicine or actually even in the home health scenario, our subjects like their robotic caregivers because they're less embarrassing and they don't gossip with the neighbors, All right? <laughs> so if you look at shortage of home health workers and uh, possible disparities there, so there's, there's many dimensions to soci societal impact and increasing uh, disparities around this topic, and it's important for our community to keep framing it around these larger issues. Can I invite people to come into the session at 345? Uh, just a continuation. <laughs> Thank you to the speakers again.